I'm sure everyone has that one corner of the shop that's an absolute nightmare, and typically it's where extra screws, cutoffs, whatever it happens to be, goes to die. For me, it's right behind the table saw. And designing this lathe stand really gave me the opportunity to clean out this space and make sure I'm utilizing it the best I can. Because this stand, I guess slash storage cabinet, is gonna be for the lathe, I wanna make sure it's as beefy as possible. So you'll notice that the side pieces are double three quarter inch plywood that I laminated together. And you'll see how that comes together a little bit later on. See, I told you, this is me gluing up one of the sides for the, the lathe cart. The brad nails are really just to hold it in place while the glue dries. That's where the strength in any of these kind of projects really comes from. Oh, and in a sea of beige wood, make sure you label all your pieces. That way you don't end up cutting a piece that is maybe, you know, a finished piece. And uh, you can guess why I know that. Whenever I'm cutting a toe kick, I usually use my bandsaw and I set up an auxiliary fence or well, I guess really a stop block on the outfeed of my bandsaw. You can hear me trying to explain it here while my microphone isn't working. But anyways, the idea is that I can cut out a two by two square perfectly on the bandsaw every time. So if you're doing something that is maybe a bank of cabinets and not just two sides, your setup is perfect every single time. I did the same trick when I built the miter saw station which if you haven't seen that video, I'll link it above. So one thing that plagued me in the miter saw video was this lip that goes around the outside edge of my garage. So on the back panel, I am going to have to make a relief cut for this, as well as there's gonna be a section where I need to cut out to allow for this gas pipe. So let's make those cuts. And again, the bandsaw was the easiest way to do this follow it up with my jigsaw. This is something I've done on majority of my shop furniture, but the most inexpensive way to make leveling feet is really just to use carriage bolts and these hammer in thread inserts. And quite literally, all you need to do is drill a hole, hammer in the insert, and then tighten down your bolt, and then later on you can come adjust it. The center support did require me to cut out a three quarter inch spacing just because it was inset from where the sides were. And I'll tell you, if you're making any kind of cabinetry, especially for your shop, your best friend is the Craig Jig. Pocket holes for me was the gateway to most of the woodworking that I do now. And I'll tell you, this just makes shop cabinets so strong and it's just such an easy way to construct them. With my sides and my middle partition ready to go, I was able to start assembling the carcass of the lathe stand. Now, like I mentioned earlier, I did have to cut out a slot for the gas line on the back of the cabinet carcass, but I waited till I had that built so I could figure out exactly where that had to be taken out of the back of the cabinet. And after adding the back support pieces, the cabinet carcass was done. And let me tell you, it is strong. I can now start sorting out the support panel for the lathe. This is the flip top section, which does lock into place, and of course holds the lathe as well. I had to make this as rigid as possible. I think this lathe is about 90 pounds. Now, if you are planning on building one of these for yourself, I will caution you that you need to make sure that the measurements for your specific lathe match this flip top table. There's two measurements you need to be concerned with. The first is how tall the lathe is, but secondly, how wide it is. 
If you don't account for the height of the lathe, you could end up with a cabinet where, well, the lathe sticks out a couple inches on the front. When I made my motorized planer lift, I used these exact same pins. They're super heavy duty, and I've had no issues with them since I purchased them. The one modification I did have to make was to the support plate that sits behind the flip top, and I just needed to cut out a small notch just to be able to account for where those set pins swung under. I did double check my measurements against my 3D model and I actually nailed this part. I was pretty pumped that my drawer carcasses were exactly what they needed to be and was able to start roughing out the material to cut my drawers. I will say midway, I had the design idea to add a fifth drawer within one of my drawers. So, you know, drawer inception. And the idea I had was to make a shorter drawer within one of the main box drawers. So I had a spot to put my lathe tools which I'll show you a little bit later on in this build. I recently got these Rockler setup blocks and I'm finding that I'm using them pretty much on everything. In this case, it was the setup where my dado needed to go for the drawer box bottom. And one thing I do when I'm building drawers, especially for anything that'll have a lot of weight in it, is I cut my dado in all four sides of the drawer, and then I cut my drawer bottom to the right size that it fits within all four sides of my drawer. That way it's encapsulated and it has support on all four sides. Oh, and if you don't know this, the most inexpensive material that I have found, well, at least locally, to use for drawer bottoms is actually mahogany door skins. I think they're around $30 a sheet, well, at least where I get them, which is significantly less than buying any kind of quarter inch plywood. And here you can see what I mean about encapsulating the bottom into the four sides of the drawer box. The four main drawer boxes done, I could start working on the small three inch drawer that would go inside one of my main drawers. Now I thought this was pretty smart, and I know I'm not the first person to ever do this, but this allowed me more or less to have a tray at the top of my drawer that could be pushed out of the way and I could still access all the storage on the lower half of the drawer. And the shorter drawer needed something to hold the tools. So obviously I broke out every red tool that I had in my shop to measure out exactly where I would be drilling the holes out to create my tool rest. YouTube's made some changes lately, which for myself as someone that does this as a hobby, has made it a little bit more difficult to grow my channel. Now, if you do like videos like this and you saw value in what I've built and maybe some of my other videos, I would love it if you hit that subscribe button. It really helps. And if this is something that you know that someone else in your life might appreciate building, how about you share this video? I hope that's not a huge ask, but it's something that would really help me and help this channel grow. Everything that I do is funded by the revenue that I receive from AdSense. Thanks guys. After testing the drawer in the drawer box, I realized that I needed some kind of a handle to be able to grip the top drawer and push it out of the way. So I just made a really simple handle using a chamfer bit in my router. This is a piece of shop furniture that I'll probably spend a lot of time standing at. So instead of drilling a hole in the front of the cabinet for a door pull or adding a door pull to the outside of the cabinet that I would consistently run into, I did opt for these. And that gauge that you saw me using earlier basically is a setup block that I built. So I knew exactly how much spacing I needed to make sure that everything sat flush and the push to open door boxes work just the way they needed to. All right, home stretch. The last few things I had to do on this build were to cut out my drawer fronts and cut out the pieces that I would need for the hinge top that hides the lathe within the cart. To give enough clearance for my hinges, I did have to route out a small channel on what would be the top cover of the lathe stand.
for me, the simplest hinge to use on any kind of project like this is just a basic piano hinge. Piano hinges are strong, but as well, they're super easy to work with. And I tend to glue them down in place before I do all my pre-drilling and attaching of all my screws. You can kind of see in the background that the lathe is actually already laying on its side within the stand. I'll be honest, I had a ton of technical issues during this video and I lost, I think, two full memory cards of footage. So some of the pieces in this video, I apologize, are missing. But if you do buy the digital plans, it's a little bit better explained on how I got to some of these steps. Oh, and make sure you stick around to the end just because the way that I ended up designing this cover, it actually has a double feature. So I'll show you what that is at the end. Here is a little trick. I have these Rockler Precision setup gauges and I'm using the uh, one quarter inch and I wanna have an eighth inch gap basically around all sides, or sorry, an eighth inch reveal. So I'm literally just gonna put this in place to represent that on both sides and measure to my far side, which gives me, which gives me 27 and seven eighths. Uh, I'm sorry, 26 and seven eighths. So I'm gonna cut my first cut for the drawer fronts at 26 and seven eighths. And I made that cut once again over with the track saw. This was too big for the miter saw, so using the track saw on the floor was the absolute safest way to make this cut. Oh, and uh, speaking of safety, comment below if you know something that changed about my table saw about halfway through this video. All right, another hot tip. When you're putting drawer faces in, super easy way to do that is to actually use something like a hot glue just to hold your drawer faces in place so you have enough time to get them where they need to be placed and then put in screws from the other side. Now, I did take the time to actually grain match all of these drawer fronts. So I had seamless grain across all four drawers. However, I ended up painting these. So I could have used some of the cutoffs and scraps, but it's just the way it worked out. For paint, you can kind of see it, but I used Total Boats Elixir, and this is in their flag blue. This is a really cool color. If you look closely at it, it might be hard in the video, you can actually still see the grain. And I really enjoyed using this product, dried fast, and definitely went on even. If you're looking to buy any products from Total Boat, I do have a discount coupon below. My wife felt this looked a little mismatched, but I wanted a bit of a pop of color. So I painted one of the drawer fronts orange, and this is actually the drawer that hides the hidden drawer tray. And yeah, with the drawer fronts attached, this build was finally done. This project has probably been about two years in the planning and probably about eight months in the execution. Just because of COVID and a bunch of other things that happened throughout the past year, I just kept running into delay after delay after delay. But after all this time, I'm so glad that I stuck with it and kept filming and kept going through this process of building this lathe cabinet. Now I will say my son's probably gonna get more use out of this than me. The wood turning is something that he's gotten more involved with than I have and he's just having so much fun making pens and doing other projects with it. Now I did promise that I would show you the hidden feature of the lid for the flip top and it's simply dust collection. I have plans to upgrade the dust collection in my shop hopefully in the next 12 months so I designed this in such a way where the cabinet actually work as a funnel to help with the dust collection. As always I super appreciate you watching this video Hit that like button, hit that subscribe button if you haven't already, and we'll see you on the next build. Oh, and if it helps, here's actually some of the other shop projects that I've built, queued up and ready to go for you.